difference between Dostoevsky and Nietzsche in this regard, because their ideas are very similar in many, many ways. They're, they're like, one's more rational and explicit, and one's more narrative and literary, but they're like the same spirit. And, and, but Dostoevsky is in some sense deeper, and I think Nietzsche would have agreed with this, and I know that Nietzsche know, knew more about Dostoevsky than people thought. There's been recently scholar, scholarly work on that account. Dostoevsky, in some ways, was closer to beauty. His work was closer to beauty than Nietzsche's because Dostoevsky's work was literary and artistic, and so he dealt in that aesthetic realm. And... Uh, the Idiot, for example, it, The Idiot's a very interesting book because, and, and you see this in, in, other, uh, in other bits of Dostoevsky's work as well, is that his, his most ethical characters can lose every argument with rationalists and still be better men. And you see that in the book because the book allows them to be embodied rather than mere carriers of propositional arguments. And beauty is non-propositional. And so it, it goes under our, our, our narcissistic and blind rational intellect that overvalues its ability. That's the spirit of Lucifer that Milton warned everyone about. It goes under that and grabs you. And if you pay attention to that, then it's a, it's a pointer to what is beyond your understanding. And so it's vital it's vital. And Dostoevsky knew that. And Solzhenitsyn read that and he thought, I see. I see what he means. I understand what he means. And, you know, one of the characteristics of our modern culture, especially in the architectural realm, is that it's replete with ugliness. I mean, I've gone to medieval villages in Europe, especially in East, what used to be East Germany, that were so beautiful. They just made me cry when I was in, was, when I was in the downtown. I thought, my God, this is so unbelievably beautiful. How did people manage this? And, and to think about all the effort that was poured into those cathedrals, monuments to divine beauty. What imagination those people had. And what commitment. And we, we can't do that. Modern people can't do that. And so it's a terrible loss. And it's partly because we just don't take such things seriously. And that's a, that's a, that's a big mistake because they are more serious than anything else. Beauty, that's more serious than anything. Except perhaps truth. But it's a pointer, you know, in these religious thinkers, philosophically speaking, Christian thinkers, they thought of God as the sum, summum bonum, the, the sum of all good things. Well, truth is something, and, and beauty is something, and courage is something. These virtues that we all recognize as virtues or are tormented by our conscience if we don't. You sum those all together, that's the ideal that binds us all. And, and that's God for all intents and purposes. You might say, well, is that real? It's like, well, it depends on what you mean by real. And people laugh at me because I say that sort of thing fairly frequently. You know, it depends on what you mean by real. But when you ask the question, is something real? It's like an equation. And the right response to that is, well, what do you mean by real? And you think, well, that's an evasion. It's like, no, I'm just not accepting your presuppositions as a precondition for this discussion. You can't use that sleight of hand. So beauty, it's like, beauty tells you to be more than you are. Beauty tells you to aspire to that which is beyond you. Beauty says there is something beyond you. All of that. And it does that in an enticing manner, right? It invites you to come along. It's the opposite of authoritarianism. It's an invitation. It's like the most beautiful woman you can possibly imagine waiting there for you on the dance floor, inviting you. That's beauty. And that's an invitation to be the sort of man who could dance with that person. You think you don't take that seriously? Like, you get rejected by some woman you... You admire that her beauty has captivated you and you're rejected because you're less than you could be. You think you don't take that seriously. It's a m miracle you don't cut your thro throat. You take it seriously. You just don't know it. You don't know what, you're, what she's angry about. Why is she react rejecting you? It's because you're not all you could be. 
and some of that's laid at your feet. And men are angry with women all the time because that's what women do. That's what they tell them all the time. And it's a terrible thing. But can you blame them? What else would they do? And what else would you want them to do? You know, in your shallow thoughts, you'd think, well, I wish that I was always accepted. Every advance was accepted uncritically. Well, that world would be hell very rapidly if it was actually the case. I wanted to ask you about your work on Beyond Order. Our translators and editors have pointed out that it has a very distinctive language and many levels of complexity to explore and comprehend. The peculiarity of this language is that it somehow helps the reader set his perception, set his mind on the book's narrative. It flows very easily and deeply into the reader's mind. Is there a special technique you use when you build up a sentence? Because we were comparing this book with your other works, and we noticed that your wording has changed a bit. It became even more accurate, even though it seemed like it couldn't be any more accurate. But it became even more vivid, and we all enjoyed working on the book. Well, that's remarkable that you, you said deep in a light way. When I was teaching at Harvard, I, I was really concentrating on my Maps of Meaning course, although I paid plenty of attention to the personality course as well, and they fed in, into each other quite nicely. I was struck by this idea one day, and Maps of Meaning was such a serious course because it dealt with atrocity. It dealt with the worst evils that I could extract out from the last hundred years of history, and that's pretty dark. And so it was very serious, heavy, and Maps of Meaning is a heavy book. There's, there's not much humor in Maps of Meaning. And I ha kept having this idea that I should, if I would, had really mastered this material, I could present it in a manner that was light. And I thought, well, how in the world could you possibly present such things in a manner that was light? It's not like I don't appreciate the necessity for humor. I love talking to comedians, uh, the, the, the most enjoyable interviews I've had. And pr I think probably the most successful ones in some ways have been with comedians. And the people I grew up with, I had a group of close friends from say grade eight to, so I was about 13 till I was about 20. I was five or six of them. And all we ever did was try to make each other laugh. All of our interactions were wit competitions, essentially. And some of them were m way much funnier than me. One friend of mine in particular, Randy Carlstad, was, he was a, he's so, so insanely funny. I, I saw him again on my 50th birthday and he made me laugh so hard. I, I, I could literally, I could hardly breathe. He was so funny. And so I, I love humor. And most of what I watch on television is stand-up comedy or, or idiot humor like the Trailer Park Boys or something like some lowbrow, <laughs> horrible lowbrow show like that, which I really enjoy. So there's something to this lightness that's crucially important. Uh, and I, don't, I, I haven't quite puzzled it all out. I know when I'm on top of things that I can maintain my sense of humor. And I haven't always been able to do that especially in interviews, um, you know, over the last five years, because they, well, for a variety of reasons, <laughs> for a variety of reasons, sometimes it was the vitriolic nature of the interactions and so forth. But I know when I'm at my best that, you know, I, I have a sense of humor and I can keep things light, even if they're deadly serious. And I'm, I'm very happy to hear that the translators have seen that combination of lightness, but, but depth in, improve as I continued to write. I wasn't sure about that. I, I wrote Beyond Order under very uh, trying conditions. I was unbelievably ill while I wrote that book. I, um, uh, ter it was terrible. So I'm glad that, it, that that worked because I didn't, I had no idea if it would, but I'm very happy to hear that that's been the experience of, of the translator because they're obviously interacting with this text in a very serious way. And I'm thrilled that, that it was chapter eight in particular that was most affecting because that was a particular favorite of mine. That, that issue of beauty, is so, it's so unbelievably, crucially important to, to what's happening in the world today because of what it, what it implies. So, you know, that people wonder what the purpose of such things as classical music, what's the purpose of classical music, let's say, you could say this about any musical form, and I like a very w wide variety of music. Well, you know, 
And you see this with psychologists, even psychologists I admire, they tend to just wave their hands about the entire cultural capability of, of human beings as if all of this entertainment, music, drama, art, literature, that's some, it's just entertainment, you know, that's all it is. It's not an, the central part of our, of our function as human beings or the central part of our culture. This is completely backwards. It's absolutely backwards. It's, it's crucial and vital. So the lightness, well, that's good, you know, and, and I've become more healthy recently. In the last month, I've recovered a lot, thank God. I can think again a bit, and my sense of humor, I'm hoping, will come back, and, and I hope I can maintain it. I'm going on tour again, I think, next year, perhaps for the whole year, and it would be nice to have a, a sense of humor <laughs> while that's happening. And, 